Hey there, movie fans. Welcome to Collider's For Your Consideration. This is our weekly award show for Counting Them Down, Counting Down till the Academy Awards on February 24th, 2019. You know, that, that seems like it's far away. Trust me, it's not. It's going to be here before you know it. So far this year, we've been doing a great show on For Your Consideration. We've been talking about great categories, great conversations, great guests like Adam Driver. But this week, we have a very special guest we'll cut to in a second. But first, to announce, we are talking about Best Documentary. And this year, we've had quite a few. This has been a great year, kind of a breakthrough year for documentaries, critically and commercially. Joining me, as always, to weigh in to have that great conversation, those great conversations, those great talks, the one, the only, she is the amazing, the astounding, the fantastic, the sensational, Perry Nemiroff. It never gets old, never gets old, man. It's always a love fest with you, Perry. <laughs> also a love fest, the invincible, the amazing, the fantastic, <laughs> the legend, he is a legend, Jeff Snyder. <laughs> Thank you very much, Scott. <laughs> what a wind up. I got a lot to live up to. Well, this show especially is going to be great because I'm very, very excited to announce our very, very special guest. He is the director of this year's highest grossing documentary. He is also an Academy Award winner for 20 Feet from Stardom. Please welcome Morgan Neville. Thanks for having me. It's great. You're like the Fred Blassie of awards coverage. I love, it. Great. I love yes. that. Can I quote you on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Awesome. Well, first of all, congratulations, yeah. because, because Won't You Be My Neighbor is, is not only the highest grossing documentary of 2018 with almost $23 million domestically, but it is also just recently a one best documentary at the Critics' Choice Documentary Awards. So congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank you. Like, what is your take on the the critical and the commercial success of what won't, won't you be my neighbor i mean it's um i wish i could say i knew it was going to happen all the time <laughs> i don't you know there's so many things beyond our control we can't control the timing of when we're making films because it takes us years to make films um but i don't know like a year ago it seemed like you couldn't pay people to go into theaters to see documentaries and something happened this year and we can talk about that so many things have happened um, but there was a cultural moment that happened this year, not only with my film, but with so many great films. And, um, you know, if I knew what it was, I'd bottle it and sell it. <laughs> well, that's very true. <laughs> What's been the reaction to the movie that you've heard from people who are not familiar with Mr. Rogers? Because we were actually, just before we started taping, yeah. we were having the conversation outside in our office because someone did not grow up in the States mm -hmm. where he mm -hmm. is just so well known to anybody who grew up in a, in a certain time it's period. It's really strange because everybody in America knows him, and virtually nobody outside of America knows him. So he got zero coverage outside. So I just, I was in England a few weeks ago, and we screened it for a number of English audiences, and it's really interesting because the first 10 minutes of the film plays differently because there's no kind of rush of nostalgia because, and also in England, they have a very, you know, long history of tawdry history of til children's TV presenters. So I think they're all <laughs> expecting something really, really Terrible. bad to happen. Yeah. Um, but I, basically, after 15 or 20 minutes, the film plays exactly the same. So by the end of the film, they're there. It's just interesting. So I feel like the film works, and I think that's because the film's not really a nostalgic film. It's a film about kind of current ideas. Um, but I had no idea what that was going to be until I screened it. I'm curious, like, what kids' reactions are to this movie if they end up, you know, seeing this film. And I don't even know is the is the show Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is that a, a streaming somewhere? Is that available yeah, for so, kids to watch? So the show really kind of went off the air in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. and then kind of vanished for a while. And then Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which is this the number one animated show on kids PBS now, has been on for maybe four or five years. So little kids know Daniel Tiger through this animated cartoon. And uh -huh. so they, when they see Fred Rogers, it's like kind of familiar and they know the songs and it's like, this is Daniel's daddy or something. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, but in between, there's this group, like my kids are 12 and 13 mm -hmm. and they had no relationship to him. So that was interesting for them to see the film, which completely worked for them. But again, was kind of a strange indoctrination and into Fred Rogers, uh, but now, for those of you with kids, on Amazon Prime, there are at least 100 old episodes of oh, wow. okay. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So if you have kids, that's a good way to, to show them the show. Because I figured your doc would have sort of you know reignited interest in that show and everything. Absolutely. And I've heard from so many people who are now showing their kids Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And people think, well, kids have 
you know, different attention spans now. But mm-hmm. the thing is, kids don't come out of the womb with ADD. You right. know, like kids are kids. You know, mm-hmm. Fred often said the outside of the world of children change, but the inside of a child never changes. You know, that they're the same. Mm-hmm. You know, when we were doing, we did a, a when on opening weekend back in mm-hmm. June. You know, you and I did a, a marathon, four back-to-back Q and A's at the ArcLight Theater. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that was that was great. Yeah. But the thing that really struck me that day was was uh, uh, on the second half of our of our day. It, it occurred to me that this was opening weekend, and this was a Saturday afternoon, and the theaters were sold out. They were full, mm-hmm. and I remember I I had asked the question. Okay, by by show of hands. How many of you have never seen Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? And half the audience raised their hand, but yet here they were in the theater watching this documentary. Like, why? Well, probably because the person they came to the theater with had loved oh, Mr. Yeah. Rogers. <laughs> That's probably why. But I've seen it again and again with people who are either too old or too young to know who he was, who have discovered the film, and it's spoken to them in kind of a profound level. Because really what he's talking about isn't about this um, you know, wave of nostalgia about uh, watching his show. It's, he's talking about these ideas that are therapeutic and deep, and, and, um, and I think it's actually part of why the film played so well in theaters is it's the kind of film you want to see with other people. There's mm-hmm. a communal aspect of seeing the film with other people, and honestly, you know, again, I don't know how this is going to work. I just make the film. <laughs> yeah. I make the film I want to see, but when we had our first screening at Sundance, literally the first screen, the first time it had ever been screened for at the a mark. group of people at the mark, and there were 500 people there. And the end of that film, um, it was it was just one of the all-time great moments of my career. Like, people were crying, people were hugging, st- hugging strangers, somebody, you know, it, it was just amazing. And I felt like in that moment, from that moment on, the audience acted like this is our film. And when an audience takes ownership over a film, I mean, there's no greater kind of compliment to Mm -hmm. as a filmmaker when people feel like, oh, you made this film for me or this film speaks to me. And that experience, that theatrical experience repeated itself again and again. That's the beauty of what he accomplished, too. I mean, just thinking about growing up, it's like so much of him and his uh, his lessons in the show that it feels like it's still a part of me and to have a movie to bring that out again and then not just to have a movie have me tap into that kind of nostalgia but also give me the impression that this gives me a chance to be able to pass it on to other people. It's It's got this ripple effect that I don't think is gonna stop anytime soon. Well, it's interesting because, you know, for those of us who watch the show, our relationship with the show, our memories of the show, predate what we what what I can really actively remember anymore. It's like it was there before I was there. And in a way what the show was about, it was like teaching kids how to be people. Like this is how you should act and treat other people and treat yourself. Like these fundamental lessons. And in watching the film, certainly in making the film, it not only makes you revisit those fundamental lessons of like it seems like we're losing track of all the time, but also to revisit a part of yourself you probably haven't spent a lot of time thinking about. Like you don't spend your days thinking about those earliest moments of your life Mm -hmm. and kind of those foundational moments. And there's something about the film that gets back to the foundation of how how we should be. It's a comforting place to to go back to, especially right now. Uh, Yeah, Yeah. well that's the thing. Okay, that's the point. The thing that struck me about the film, I was at that screening at the market Sundance, uh, and which, by the way, the Sundance this year was an outstanding year, as always, for mm-hmm. documentaries. Mm-hmm. A lot of the films we're going to be talking about premiered there. But to go on what you just said, how this movie makes you feel right now, you know, for me, and I think uh, for a lot of people, mm-hmm. and, I, and I, I believe you, you talked about this as well, it's not about nostalgia. It's mm-hmm. about how, with everything that is going on in our times today, that Mr. Rogers, like, what would we need like he the the, the idea mm-hmm. of him mm-hmm. is comforting yeah and just even though he's not with us uh, physically he is spiritually and like like how would he address like the school shootings how would he address mm-hmm. like the the division in our country mm-hmm. politically i mean i've thought a lot about this and really kind of my initial impulse to make the film was watching him as an adult and just being moved by him, and not just moved emotionally, moved intellectually, feeling like, where's this voice in our culture? Like, who's advocating for these things? Like, how can I just put more of that out in the culture? And in doing that and seeing people respond to it, it it actually really gives me some some hope and feels like something we can maybe build upon. 
Um, we, we will have to talk about some of the other contenders shortly, but I did want to say, you know, your film's a very efficient, economical 94 minutes. Uh, <laughs> I and, and love so, short, was, was economical that, was films. Was there anything that you, you know, had to leave on the cutting room floor that you didn't have time to get into the movie? Uh, I mean, there were scenes that I really liked that are on the cutting room floor. Um, yeah, not that I regret leaving them there, but but there were, I mean, there were things like, I mean, a detail that, that I, I've often used about, which is at one point he got more mail than anybody in America and that he responded personally to every single letter he got. <laughs> so if you think about how much of his life he spent doing that, and to him that wasn't a chore, that was like the real work. You know, the show is just a way to introduce himself to these kids who needed this kind of ministry. And so that is kind of an unbelievable fact. That's interesting. Um, but there's another scene that I kind of, I loved that it was about his, um, as his boys became teenagers, he was trying to relate to them, and this is in the 70s, and he was saying, well, you know, what are you listening to? Like, that's how I can relate to you. Give me the music you're listening to. And because Fred had been a composition major and he was a pianist, he thought, well, music is how I can connect with my teenage boys. So they would give him tapes of Frank Zappa and The Grateful Dead. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, th and his son said, you know, the music I gave my dad that he loved the most was Bob Marley. Oh wow! You know, and if you think about the message of the Bob Marley songs, right. you know, it's like exactly Don't a worry, message. Be happy. Exactly. Well, that's you know, Bobby McFerrin, but it right. says, "Yeah, one love right. and everything." Sorry. You know, um, and he said, "Of course, I didn't give him the ganja songs." Yeah. Well, well, also, you know, th this it's interesting that that you have two documentaries yeah. this year about uh, iconic figures. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one about about the the great. The like the greatest, most influential filmmaker ever, <laughs> only ever of all time, uh, starting but not ending with Citizen Kane, like all the way through up until up until his finally released final film, and you document that in the Love Me When I'm Dead, which they they Orson do. Wells, Orson you gotta Wells, say his name. yes, yeah. <laughs> you know Orson Wells. I mean, they do love him. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, they love him more yeah. dead than dead than they would when he was alive. Um, but like like working on on films about two iconic figures who were different. Uh, what was sort of like the common sort of responsibility that you felt in, in depicting both of these characters. Sure, and they, you know, it's kind of an accident that they came out in the same year <laughs> because the Wells film was going on for years and um, and they happened to come out the same year. So I wasn't working on them quite on top of each other in the same way. But they were both people who at different times in my life were heroes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're both people who didn't really care what the popular sentiment was or what the conventional sentiment was. And I think as an artist, that's the most kind of heroic idea, the most kind of romantic idea of like not caring what conventional wisdom is and doing your own thing. And both of them were absolutely people that did that. So we're sitting here right now on Collider FYC and we have the luxury of having someone in the studio who, one, has made a movie this year that is our number one pick for best documentary. We'll just put it out there it right is, now. Yes. So when we <laughs> yeah. compile our list at the end of the episode, Won't You Be My Neighbor is at number one for Collider FYC. Spoiler alert. Yeah, really, <laughs> you know your stuff. But on top of that, you've also been through this yeah. process yeah. before. So can you shed a little bit of light on what that is like for a filmmaker? When does that uh, switch flip in your brain that, OK, I made my movie. It's well received. Now I've got to turn on that awards campaign mode and, you know, really just make sure it, it gets out there. Because that's the beauty of the Academy Awards and also the beauty of award season period is, mm -hmm. yeah, it's nice to get a statue. But also, when you have a movie this special that could change lives, it's also a great opportunity to get it out there even more. Yep. Sure. I mean, you make your film so that people discover it. You don't make a film just because, you know, you're trying to do buffo box office. If you were, you wouldn't be making documentaries or else you're an idiot. So, you know, you make documentaries because you feel like it says something. And so, you know, of course, awards recognition is part of that of people feeling like they recognize and they want to amplify the message of your film. Um, I've, you know, been down this path before. Every year it seems to get more and more insane. You know, I don't know exactly when it transitions from being kind of just trying to get your film out there to kind of trying trying to make sure um, it resonates with the words people too. Um, it's all kind of a gray area, but it just seems like, I mean, there's both, um, you know, obviously kind of more competition and more money and more great docs, but also um, 
it's just the the world of documentaries has grown so much. You know, and I've been doing this for 25 years. Wow. <laughs> and when I started, there was nothing cool about docs. You know? <laughs> I love them, um, but it was really niche. And um, just to see now that we're doing things like this, that yep. people even care about documentaries, mm -hmm. is kind of mind blowing to me still. I think it has you to know? do with, you know, not only are, is the equipment more readily available and people can mm -hmm. shoot these things, but stories are more available thanks to the internet. We're reading about and hearing about so many more stories that then encourage people to, you know, probe more in depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, there are 166 documentaries this year that qualified, wow. and, you know, it's amazing how many, and I've been watching binging as many as I can. Good, because yeah. that leads right. into yeah. the next yeah. part yeah. of our yeah. conversation. Good. Good. So, yes, I mean, you know, before I even walked in the door, yeah. I mean, you know, I just said, you know, we, I looked at Jeff and, and Perry, and I said, number one, right? Yeah? And they're like, oh, yeah. So, so I mean, without question, I mean, Won't You Be My Neighbor is just a movie that we just all just love so much. And And uh, the only other documentary that I saw in, in my 18 years ago in the Sundance that had at the impact on me that, that this one did was Life Itself oh, yeah. about Roger Ebert, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I saw that at the mark mm -hmm. as well. But I digress. Mm -hmm. Another film that, that I saw at Sundance, and this is a one that I know that we all loved, and I'm hoping it's on our list, I'm pretty sure it is, all right, actually, I'm just going to turn this over to Perry. Oh, What's wait, next no. on your list? You can't do that, because yeah. because now I'm thinking, I'm not sure if, uh, it's okay. if our, our it's two okay. and three are reversed. All right. My number two is RBG. It's yet another documentary that I think, you know, actually when I was writing my review of uh, On the Basis of Sex recently for the website, I was thinking to myself, like, I wanted to write the sentence, oh, there's no better time to have a movie like this telling this specific story. But really, I mean, isn't any time a good time to reiterate the <laughs> yeah. importance of what Ruth Bader Ginsburg did for this country? So the fact that this movie is here now, I think is super awesome, but I feel like this is a movie that, similar to Won't You Be My Neighbor, is something that I'm gonna continue to tell people to check out for years to come. I think it's fantastic, we need it right now, and that's why I have it at number two. Jeff? It's number two on my list as well, even though I haven't seen it. And you know how much I love my number three. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. So I haven't seen RBG, but I do just feel like people are loving this movie. It's kind of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's year, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, between, between on the basis of sex and just uh, you know, everything that's happening uh, politically in this country, um, I don't think that she will be denied. And I, and I think that she is Fred Rogers' stiffest competition. Uh, absolutely. And the film is directed by Betsy West and Judy Cohen. I mean, she, this is a... The movie Movie is she is a feminist icon, but the, the heart of the film is, is the love story between her and her husband, mm -hmm. and uh, a great song by Diane Warren, "I'll Fight." But so, Morgan, yeah. what did you think of RBG? I mean, <laughs> RBG for us was hugely helpful too, because that was the first documentary that came out this year that kind of blew open the box office. Yeah, too. that's true. So, mm -hmm. so I feel like every every film, ours included, and Three Identical Strangers, and these other films, all were kind of building on the momentum that RBG started. Um, you know, and I'm so grateful for that. You know, my I made sure my 13 year old daughter watched RBG and oh, you know wow. responded to it in such a strong way. So you know, I'm I'm very thankful for that. I made sure my yeah. cat dressed up as RBG. So <laughs> oh yeah, that was awesome. The same thing right now. <laughs> the glasses and everything, awesome. <laughs> well, I I believe that your number three is my number two because RBG was my number three. This right. is how we roll. This okay. is how we roll okay. the show. Uh, so yes, uh, it's three identical strangers. So yes, three, three identical, identical strangers. strangers. Okay, you go. I, I thought uh, I saw this movie at Sundance. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. It's just such a unique story <laughs> in the way that that it's told. I, I just loved everything about it, um, and it's such a fascinating mystery. Like when you think it's about one thing, and then it pivots, and it turns out to be about another thing entirely. Um, yeah, I just can't say enough about this movie. Okay. What can you say about this? No, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, it reminds me of this um, quote, if I can paraphrase correctly, that, you know, the difference between the scripted world and the documentary world is in the scripted world, um, things have to behave like you would expect them to behave. But in the real world, the impossible happens every day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's the kind of thing. This is right. the classic example of a story. If you wrote it into a scripted movie, people would say, that would never happen. Mm -hmm. But it did happen. And it's just like a you know, one of those fantastic stories. I was kind of aware of the beginning of what they tell you about in this movie, but when mm -hmm. it shifts gears and starts to dive into something else, that's when I was sitting there, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. I'm glad I'm seeing all this now. Oh no, this is crazy. Yes. It's never, <laughs> it's never gonna leave me. And it definitely has it. And yet, a, yet another one, these top three in particular. I, yeah. So I, I hate to admit this in mm -hmm. front of you, but most yeah. of the time my top 10 is comprised of narrative films and I'm mm -hmm. just telling, oh, go 
see this, go see this. I can't believe how many people I am just begging to go see <laughs> these three movies in particular mm -hmm, in theaters, mm -hmm. at home at this point, but I think these three are just vital viewing and Dare I say, I think these three are pretty much sure things for Oscar nominations this year. You're 100% right about that, though, in, in terms of like the overall uh, field of films this year. I, I mean, Won't You Be My Neighbor and, and Three Identical Strangers are both in my top five for the year. Yeah, I, like, I agree. Documentaries. And, uh, okay, so, so the interest, okay, so, so the film premiered at Sundance, and then it opened in the summer, and here you are. You are still, Perry, mm -hmm. you are still careful not to spoil, even though the movie's been in theaters right. and it's on DVD. I cannot remember the last time. Okay, let me just back up a second. Yeah. I'm at Sundance, and uh, my good friend Mara Reinstein, uh, she's a writer for a parade and she's a, a film critic as well. So she sends me a text, you have to see Three Identical Strangers, mm -hmm. because it wasn't on my, on my schedule. I said, what's it about? She goes, just go see it. Trust right. me. Don't read anything about Don't it. Don't read anything about it. That's right. what she said. Yeah. Just go go in blind. So so Morgan, Perry, Jeff, I go in. I'm watching the movie. Yeah. These guys, the way they are reunited, these triplets mm -hmm. are reunited. Neither knew the other existed. The way they came together was just like uh, incredible. And then the... Uh, their, their, their time in the sun, you know, basking in the glow of their, of their fame in the early 1980s. It was so inspiring. It was like a feel-good crowd pleaser. But then I look at my watch and I'm like, it's only 20 minutes into the film. Where is this going? Like, what are they gonna do for the next like hour and 10 minutes? And holy moly, I could not, no one who did not see this movie or was not familiar with the story could have predicted why they were born, why they were separated. and. It was shocking. It was uh, totally unpredictable. It was disturbing. And it was very, very tragic. If I was a documentary filmmaker and that story like fell into my lap, I, I mean, I'd like <laughs> imagine. <laughs> yeah, Tim Warrell did an, a, a fantastic job uh, directing that film. But yeah, that that one of the, I agree completely, both of you. I mean, it's just, those are, those are the three. Um, okay, now we get to the fourth. All right, uh, Jeff. <laughs> Uh, I have again. I haven't seen this film. I've heard nothing but amazing things. I, I almost went to see it this weekend, and I, and I missed the, the showtime. Free Solo. Mm -hmm. Free Solo. Number four mm -hmm. on my list. Okay. I have Free Solo, but I have it at number five, okay. and it's also at the top of my wa my <coughs> must watch list right now. I remember at a at a tiff this year. I wanted to make time to see it, and for whatever reason, I never got around to it. But this is another one that I feel like people are talking about more so than they usually do when it comes to documentaries. I mean, even just sitting on Twitter and people asking, have you seen this and this this year? I can't believe how much free solo has come up. And I think with, with our viewership, that might be due well, to it, some confusion. It sounds like a solo. real... <laughs> if that's what gets people oh my to God, see yeah. good solo. movies, yes. fine, fine by me. But <laughs> this one's been on my radar for a little while and I can't wait to watch it myself. Uh, okay, so so here's another... another um, yeah, wait, so uh, you haven't seen it. I haven't have you seen, seen it? it? No, I haven't. Have okay, you seen I it? saw it. Okay, okay. but here, here's the thing about word of mouth. Yeah. So I had that experience with Mara Reinstein about, uh, about uh, uh, three identical strangers. So I'm at Telluride, and I'm at a, uh, a, a sort of like a function for another film. And it's a director who I really, really just love and adore. And just, I mean, he's only done like three films. Well, this is his fourth. Uh, it's Damien Giselle. Is what, <laughs> come on. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm like trying to build it up. You totally. Why don't you just tell me what that? You build it up. Everybody knows you're talking about Why don't you just about tell stuff? me that Santa Claus doesn't exist or that the Easter Bunny doesn't exist? But, yeah, so, so I'm at this party. And, 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 you know, I loved First Man. I thought it was so visceral. And, and uh, unlike any other movie or anything ever made about the space race, and, and so he just starts talking. You got to see this movie, Free Soul. Trust me, you got to see it. Make sure you see it on the big screen. Try to see it before you yeah. leave Telluride. And I did. And I'm so. I mean, I got the, you know Damien Chazelle telling me to see a movie, and I listened, and I'm glad I did. Uh, did you see it? I did at Telluride. Oh, great! <laughs> and I was there with my wife and kids. You know, and even though uh, Alex the climber was standing there in the theater beforehand, so you know <laughs> he survives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yet it was one of the most harrowing watches. I admit I closed my eyes a number of times because I got I was so Were your palms sweat. You know, I absolutely, <laughs> I absolutely. I mean, it is a great film to see on a big screen. It is too. essential yeah. to see on a and big screen. And that's why I think it's going to get a, a nomination because it, it does seem to be this uh, cause celeb as far as, as 
as seeing it in a theater. Like you got it. Like I think you know, won't you be my neighbor? Three identical strangers. Those films will play just as strongly at home uh, on a, on a disc. But Free Solo is something that I really want to make a conscious effort to see up there. So do it. <laughs> trust I'm trust us. To. You know. But but the other thing, uh, the movie started by uh, Chai Vassar Holly and uh, Jimmy Chin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting thing about about the film is that the filmmaking process is part of the process. Like like they had the like you know you're watching him. I mean look at that look at that picture right behind you. Yeah. I mean that yeah. had to be filmed. So you got to have people there who were climbing with him. Now now uh, Alex Honnold climbed without any help, any ropes, anything, mm -hmm. which is why it's called Free Solo. Uh, and But the filmmakers obviously had the ropes and they had the cameras and they had everything else. But uh, just the way the movie's about, uh, uh, about uh, you know, just overcoming your fears, sure. literally and figuratively. I mean, I think just the fact that um, it's not just that you know they're climbing with him, filming it, but that the actual process of them filming it affects his psychology and climbing it. And something, you know, with no margin of error that I thought that was very smart of them to bring that into the what the film is about. Like us making the film is changing what the film is documenting. Absolutely. Okay, so so we all have four movies on our list. Some right. of the places are mm -hmm. a little different mm -hmm. uh, after you get after number one. But uh, these four movies, you know, Won't You Be My they Neighbor, Free Identical yeah. Stranger, RBG, and Free Soul, they're all on our list. Now, see, now, Morgan, we get to the tricky part. And I like yeah. how different those movies yeah. are, though, Scott, too. Oh, f absolutely. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally different. Yeah. And, by, and i got to say that that uh, oftentimes, especially at Sundance, I find the documentaries to be far more engrossing and interesting and fascinating than the narrative features. Although, you know, I mean, look, I, I love that too, obviously. But uh, when we you're get right, to number right, they, <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah, it, no, they're really, amazing docs at Sundance. Yeah, these these yeah, are fun yeah. docs too, though. Like a lot of the documentary nominees usually are very serious, don't you feel like? And I feel like this is a kind of lighter bunch. Uh, well, that's I, I, I would say that it's a it's a it's a more diverse bunch of, of films that uh, um, you know I've seen films about about uh, you know Vietnam or or uh, or Iraq, uh, you know, uh, the real sort of heavy heavy films. Right. Not that Free Identical Strangers is not heavy, it definitely is, but there's there's a lot more range of emotion watching these movies. So so when you get to number five, okay, what's rounding out your list, Perry? That So it's not my number five. Free Solo is my number five. At number four, I don't think you guys have this, but I put Shirkers. I watched that the other day. It's available on Netflix, so anybody could watch it right now, but... As someone who spent a good deal of her life dreaming of making a movie and basically being open to taking just about any risk there is out there, this just just really struck me, the whole story. And it's, it actually goes back to what you were saying, the idea of if this was conveyed in a narrative feature, nobody would ever believe it all played out just this way. But I just love the idea of it being, you know, a movie covering the making of a movie and how they tap into some of the, some of like the magical surreal, surreal qualities of what they were trying to make with the original Shirkers. And it's also got a really engaging mystery vibe to it where once it started, I couldn't turn it off because I needed all the answers and I don't want to uh, spoil anything obviously for anybody who hasn't seen it but where it winds up at the end I found extremely satisfying and even kind of motivating even though I have no plans to make another feature anytime soon seeing this it kind of makes me want to you know jump off that cliff again and give it a go all right what's on your five uh, we, we have the same one. Um, it's Fahrenheit 11.9. Yeah. I, okay. I just think, um, you know, given how liberal Hollywood is for the most part, uh, any anti-Trump doc that sheds a light on the, the insanity of that whole administration and other important issues, like, you know, there's a lot about teachers in the film. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it kind of zigs and zags a little. It's not maybe uh, quite as good as, as Fahrenheit 9.11 was, mm -hmm. um, but I thought it played very strong in, in, at the premiere, premiere that I went to and you know, it, it's one of the more higher profile docs which I think goes a long way in this category I, I was I was sort of torn between Fahrenheit 11 9 uh, uh, which which I agree with you it's it's a it's definitely a uh, a movie of the moment, uh, so to speak, uh, but it, it is not the most focused film. I mean, he goes right. off on on the teacher stuff. Right. He goes off on the water supply in Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, always bringing it back to his. It's uh, all powerful stuff. Yeah, it's you know? definitely mm -hmm. definitely powerful. The other film that I really uh, sort of liked a lot was Science Fair, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. another National mm -hmm. Geographic documentary. Uh, but both of them, uh, I could interchange either one of them. Um, but which but, one is your five? 
Fahrenheit 11. Okay. <laughs> so, so for the purposes, you know, when, when there's a, a majority yes. rule here, uh, Perry, yeah. you know, love you to pieces. I know, I on. know. Well, I like shirkers. <laughs> they are. Okay. Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> okay, you know what? In that case. Wait, I think we should give our guest of honor. You've got to give guest of honor the, the, the tiebreaker here. There you go. There's our five. There's our five. Okay, so wait, let's talk about some <laughs> other stuff before, before yeah, we. Yeah, he likes to go we, with the honorable mentions. Yeah, yeah we got to <laughs> say what else is in the mix here. What else is in the mix? So, you know, Perry, Perry also mentioned Minding the Gap, which is another film I haven't seen, but it's a Hulu title, right? Is yes. It Hulu? Yeah. It's they Hulu. picked it up at Sundance, but okay. great doc made out of Cartemquin. Um, yeah, uh, fantastic. Um, uh, the Amazing Grace is not eligible, right? Because it was. They are. The gonna, they are. Oh, it, it is, is eligible. eligible. It is. They. Because I just got the screener. Oh, yes, okay. it is eligible. I know okay. it's eligible. So, so we have yeah. an Aretha Franklin doc that I hear is amazing. There's the Quincy Jones documentary I've mm -hmm. heard is very mm -hmm. good as well. Mm -hmm. There's a Whitney Houston doc. Oh, uh, the Whitney Houston doc was. And very there's good. an Orson Welles doc. Right. Right? Yes. Uh, so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, those are all, I mean, listen, those are all great movies. Um, uh, I didn't see yours, but he did. You should and see it. Are any of those it's titles great. that I just said, though, in the, like, in the mix, you think? Well, like, I, I don't know. Like, the thing about the Whitney Houston documentary and the Quincy Jones more doc uh, were uh, just being a big music buff, there was a lot that I knew about the two of them. But it's the perspective and the, uh, uh, you know, sort of seeing it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, although there was one big bomb dropped in the documentary about her past that I'd never heard, that never came to light yeah. until this movie opened, um, that, that I thought really just was, was, was shocking. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I mean, I thought that was an extraordinary, extraordinary film. For, for that reason alone, that it was like, what? Um, again, I don't want to spoil it, just see it, and you'll know what I'm talking about when you see it. If anyone wants to see a lot of these movies, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, a lot of them are available on Hulu right now. I mean, you can watch Shirkers on Netflix, but Hulu, I think, picked up quite a few of them. Yeah, they had uh, another great doc called Crime and Punishment. Yeah. Um, and Netflix also has Quincy and Shirkers, mm -hmm. and you know, most of these things, by the end of the year, you can either find them there or on iTunes or somewhere else. Okay. It just clicked for me, by the way, that he did the Orson Welles documentary. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> I was, I, even though I mentioned I was, it in everyone, the top. Everyone, I came oh, hearing great things about that. I'm like, I got to make time for that on Netflix. That along was with a eight million other things. That was a double feature Telluride, the film and the it documentary. Was, yeah. yeah, that was a good day. All right, so for the purpose of this show, so for the purpose of our special guest here, so we have our, our top five, which are obviously... Will One you be, be my, my number is number, number one. one. What's R number two? RBG, RBG is number two. Three is three. Number three. Free Soul number four. And Sugar is number five. That was okay. painless. I'll take it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that, that's how we roll here on For Your Consideration <laughs> on Collider. thank you. Well, you know what the great thing about this is, is that um, this is the first season that we've done an award show for Collider. And, and our, our, our demo, our viewers, our, our listeners, because we podcast it as well on Podcast One. Make sure that you subscribe and share. Make sure you like this version. I mean, look who we have in the studio. This is a very, very big deal. Make sure you share Collider, FYC. That's Collider's For Your Consideration with every Everyone, all your movie fans, even those fans who love movies, make sure anyone who just even has an idea of what Mr. Rogers stood for, make sure you share Collider FYC. And I gotta say, you know, this is a, a show that we, we've already done like best actor or supporting, we've done best adapted screenplay, best original screenplay. Um, and with the, with the option to revisit a lot of these categories as the year goes on, because there's still some movies we haven't seen yet, but, but documentaries, I feel like, you know, this is it. I don't know. I'm an, I feel like I have to catch up on my docs. Well, you That's do. That's December's for. You, you do. <laughs> you do. But I don't think your number one's going to change. No, I, I don't think it will either. Well, so, congratulations. We, we can't thank, thank you, you enough for Thanks being so much here. For thank you so me. much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there you have it. That is uh, that does it uh, for this episode of Collider FYC. Make sure you come back next time where we take a look at another category. So until then, FY, see you later. <laughs> Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.